All right. Okay, ready to begin. So, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm Monty Bray. I'm president of the Southway Conservationists. Note our new fancy um, banner. Um, tonight's program is both live and it is also in, on the internet as a webinar. So we have, I don't know, 50 or so people, I believe, um, on a Zoom session that can also see these slides as well as hear people in the audience and, and the speaker. So that's the technology we're trying out. Um, fingers crossed and everybody can hear okay. Um, after the program, I'm going to encourage you please to stay uh, afterwards. We're going to be about an hour for a presentation. I uh, have about uh, 15 minutes for a QA. and a And then after that, um, we're going to have a raffle. Hopefully some people bought some raffle tickets. And a couple of nice prizes over there, Jeff. Jeff's got the uh, raffle table. We got a, a customized birdhouse with our new branded Southway Conservationists and North Carolina Wildlife Federation brand on the front of the, of the box, which is burned in by our handy, uh, our uh, craftsman over here, Jeff Allen. Um, so do stay. We're also going to have uh, some refreshments and just have a chance to have a little conversation and talk to Luke about what you saw. Um, for, you know, just for those that aren't familiar with the organization, we are the South Wake Conservationists. We're one of the chapters of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and we serve uh, Southern Wake County and the surrounding region. And our mission is to protect and conserve and restore North Carolina's wildlife and the habitat. That's what it's all about. That's why we're called the Wildlife Federation. Um, but we also work to inspire. Inspiration is really important. Inspire and educate and advocate on behalf of wildlife and the habitat. And, you know, I, if, if you don't get inspired by what you're going to see tonight, I don't know what will. Um, this is really outstanding. I think uh, uh, when, you, when you hear um, some of the stories, along the trail, um, there's a lot of environment and nature in addition to the personal hardships and other stuff that goes with the stories. Um, so Luke Bennett over here is the conservation coordinator for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. He supports our chapter and a few other chapters in the area. Um, he is a graduate of Appalachian State and he was on the varsity cross country team for his full term at App State. And he also was a biology major. He studied biology, but he not only did it in the classroom, but I think he was pretty passionate about it in the outdoors as well, which led to his passion for the natural world uh, all the way around and led to his career, his beginning career now here at the Wildlife Federation in conservation. And I asked him for what, what is an interesting fact about you that, you know, a little quirky that people might not know. He told me that all the thousands of miles that he's hiked, you know, the 1,100 or so miles on the Mountains of Sea Trail, and then I think it's 2,000 something miles on the uh, um, the Appalachian Trail. He never reacted to poison ivy. And then he came to one of John's garden events. <laughs> and boy, did he get it. So, uh, so we initiated him to the North Carolina um, um, poison ivy. It is my pleasure to introduce someone who I look up to both figuratively and literally. Um, we, we love Luke. He's going to talk about um, this talk tonight, Hiking for Habitat, Lessons from the Trail. But before we get started, I want to turn it over to Shauna Finn, who is, I think it's North Carolina Wildlife Federation's newest community organizer. And uh, this is Shauna over here. She's going to moderate the session tonight. And Sean is going to explain a little bit about how we're going to handle questions and answers. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out and joining us. Um, so uh, while you all are listening to the presentation, we ask that you please hold your questions till the end. There will be time for you to have your questions answered. We ask that if you do have something to say, that you raise your hand, and then someone will bring the mic to you to ask the questions. And as for those of you joining us online, we ask that you type your questions online, and then there will be a segment where I'll read them out loud and Luke will answer your questions. So thank you. Last but not least, I just want to um, introduce um, Cassia Rivera is has volunteered to help run the camera tonight. Thank you, Cassia. 
And also we have Kingsley over here in the corner who is going to run the mic around to the audience when you have questions and answers at the end for the last 15 minutes. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand. Kingsley will bring you the mic. Okay. Over to you, Luke. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Monty, for the kind words. And um, thank you all for joining me here tonight to uh, talk about some of my hiking trips. Again, my name is Luke Bennett. I'm the conservation coordinator for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. I'm also, uh, and, and as you guys will find out tonight, I'm also an avid hiker. I uh, hiked the Mountain Sea Trail in um, 2022, and I hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2021. Um, in putting together these these slides, I, I realized I, I have a lot of content here. I have a lot of pictures. I have a lot of stories. I could I could go off on a tangent, um, you know, just about the gear or, you know, leave no trace. And that in and of itself could be an, an entire presentation. Um, so it really got me excited to kind of relive some of these stories, putting this um, this presentation together. All right, so why I started hiking, I'm going to go all the way back to my childhood very quickly. Um, I grew up in Durham, North Carolina, I had the Eno River in my backyard, a very tight knit group of friends and, um, and family and neighbors. And I spent most of my time as a kid running around outside on the trails. Um, and, you know, that's been, that involves spending time with, with my friends climbing trees, flipping logs, uh, maybe not quite leave no trace, but it definitely inspired me to, um, to join the field of conservation today. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, moving forward in my life, I, I went to school at Appalachian State University in Boone, so I had the Blue Ridge Mountains in my backyard. Definitely inspired me to get outside as much as possible. I was constantly spending weekends backpacking in the Smokies and also in Pisgah National Forest around Boone. Um, and I was also, yeah, as Monty said, I was on the, uh, the cross-country team, so I've always had this, I guess, this, this need to, um, to physically exert myself outside. I spent a lot of time running on the trails, running up and down mountains. And, and that really inspired me. It was, again, it's, it, it felt like a need that I, 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 I wanted to, to go outside and, and spend time outdoors with, with my friends on the trail, running around, hiking, all sorts of stuff. And uh, last but not least, definitely want to thank, um, well, I want to you know, thank Ellie too, but she definitely is um, a big reason to um, why I started hiking. Um, Ellie lives in Boone, she's my girlfriend. And she's, um, you know, a huge inspiration for for why I hike today, and uh, she also hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2021, and that was just six months after tearing her ACL. So tough as nails, and you know she keeps me going. Definitely keeps me inspired in, in, in all sorts of areas. All right, so moving right into it, the Appalachian Trail, the grandfather of them all, stretching nearly 2,200 miles. Um, and, and that goes through 14 states. Um, and that's really cool that it goes through so many states simply because, you know, it's, it might be an arbitrary achievement, but, you know, to see that state border so often it really is a, is a huge source of accomplishment thinking that, man, I just hiked all through Virginia or I hiked, you know, the entire length or almost the entire length of Maine. Really cool, really cool experience there. So, um, and in terms of like maintenance and management, so the, the Appalachian Trail is maintained and managed by the, um, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. That's a nonprofit organization, um, but they can't do it all by themselves. That's in partnership with some federal, um, some federal land management agencies such as the U.S. Forest Service and also the National Park Service. They, um, they, I guess, work together to, to make sure that this, main, this remains a continuous footpath across the Appalachian Mountain mountain range, which is really a huge accomplishment to think that this exists in the world today, especially on this side of the country with how populated some of these areas are, that a continuous footpath goes through this area without any breaks in between. Um, and there's 165,000 white blazes on the Appalachian Trail. Um, I got lost one time and that was on my first day. So not a great way to start, but I never got lost again, thankfully, uh, because, you know, about every other tree, uh, there was, there was a blaze telling me exactly where to go. So again, just a monumental achievement that this trail exists. And I hope that, you know, some of you will, will consider going out there if you can. All right, so I'm going to touch on my gear real quick. Again, this could be this this could have been a, a presentation in and of itself, just with the amount of intricacies that go into finding your backpack and finding things that work for you. Um, I've never been a gear nut myself. Some people obsess about it to the 
to the, upset about it to the point where they're you know sawing off their toothbrush trying to save just a couple ounces they're you know so i guess it feels a little bit more comfortable to them but i was never like that my backpack was typically about 28 pounds uh, that varied a little bit um you know it depends on how much food i had in my backpack but about 28 pounds was was my average and i think it's really important to keep your weight down as much as you can simply because um you know if you could be on top of a, a mountain ridge and a beautiful bluebird day and if you've got 50 pounds of, of weight on your back it would be very um, so just to go through really quick uh what i what i what i was carrying with me on the appalachian trail i have my backpack the ula cdt tried and true never got a hole in it still wearing it today uh the shelter I, I couldn't be too picky there just because you know i am six foot six so it's hard to find something that fits me but this one this shelter has has been through it all and i've still got a little bit of headroom at night so i can't complain there um also you know sleeping bag uh, I, I i brought a quilt with me which is essentially a, a blanket um, a little bit on the cold side probably if i were to do it again i'd want to get something warmer um, but that worked out just fine and my sleeping pad was a climate static v2 and that was a little bit tricky it's an inflatable pad so i would spend all day hiking up and down mountains and then i'd have to blow up this this um this tube essentially manually and um definitely definitely led to some some lightheaded experience but okay so another really hot topic on the trail appalachian trail food um i ascribe to the seafood diet that means seafood eat food uh you want to get as much calories as possible in you and i was probably about at 5,000 calories a day that equates to about two pounds of food and that's simply just to maintain my body weight it was um you, you hiker hunger is is definitely a real thing out on the trail um and what i was eating i ate a lot of oatmeal in the morning um ate tortilla wraps and tuna packets for lunch a lot of cliff bars in between peanut butter was one of my favorites and um ramen noodles and salmon packets for for dinner stuff that probably would make my stomach turn today but um in the in the moment it was just good to have some some hot food when i needed it and yeah that picture in the middle is um kind of a, a little bit gross but I would I would say that that's like I don't even know what kind of food that is it kind of just looks like looks like gorp but um yeah and again so I left the AT about every three to five days to resupply in one of the towns and while I was there I was able to eat a lot of fresh food and I was also able to like pack out maybe like a deli sandwich or something that I could eat on top of um on top of a mountain with a with a good view um but yeah still again this could be a whole topic but I'm gonna have to move on so uh, something i really was excited to talk to you guys about was just the plant life on the appalachian trail um it's referred to as the green tunnel simply because there's so much vegetation on the trail especially in the middle of summer when i was hiking uh so these rhododendrons and you know all all sorts of different kinds of plants would form this this tunnel around me as as i was hiking and you know even on a really bright sunny day it would cloud i mean it would it would it would block out the sun um so that was that was really cool to experience to be i guess immersed in the wild like that definitely a a rare unique experience to have today um yeah so more than 2000 species of plants exist on the appalachian trail that involves like 200 specifically to the southern appalachians so again very diverse diverse region. And that picture on the far right there is the kefir oak. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's um, a oak tree in Virginia that's 300 years old and 60 feet tall. Uh, you know, a behemoth of a tree. And it was really cool to, to be able to witness that, to walk by it. It was being guarded by mosquitoes when I got there, but still cool to, still cool to um, see something that, you know, maybe that, that was taller than me, <laughs> I guess you could say. And that brings me to animals on the Appalachian Trail. Again, um, one of the most biologically diverse areas in North America. I saw no shortage of animals while I was hiking on the Appalachian Trail. Um, you know, in terms of mammals, I never saw a moose. I saw plenty of moose poop. Uh, I never, I finally saw a moose when I lived in New Hampshire for a couple of months afterwards, but it still, I guess, it shocks me to this day that an animal that, you know, weighs you know, a couple tons can be so stealthy in the woods. Um, but yeah, definitely stepped in and around and on you know, their poop all the time. So I knew they were out there. Um, yeah, there's definitely, you know, bear, white-tailed deer, a lot of porcupine out there. Wasn't expecting that. Um, in terms of birds, 
I, 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 hawks, owls, a lot of owls. I mean, it's, um, you know, every, seems like every night when I would pitch my tent, owls, you know, a couple barred owls would, would choose a tree right above my, right above my tent to, I don't know if they were having sex or if they were fighting, but they, um, they were definitely making a lot of noise, but I, I never, I never, I guess it never bothered me to be, you know, woken up in the middle of the night by these barred owls. I thought it was a, a pretty cool experience to be able to, to hear that and, and witness that. Um, and then also want to shout out the Eastern newts that's on the top right there. They get so abundant on the Appalachian trail, especially in the middle of summer where you could be coming down with your foot and there might be six Eastern newts right below you. So you really got to watch where you're stepping. I mean, they just like light up the trail and light up the region. Um, and then also I hiked during a cicada year. That was very unique. Um, it got to the point where, you know, I was hiking with a couple of friends and we just had to shut up and keep hiking because there was no way you're going to be able to hear what your friend was saying. So um, that was cool. And it's even at night, I could hear them. But once they stopped, you could still hear them ringing in your ears. <laughs> oh, my clicker's working now. Good. Uh, so that brings me to potentially harmful wildlife. And what I definitely want to just hone in here is, you know, if you're going to spend any time outdoors, it's always a good idea to prepare as much as you can to research the region. Uh, because, you know, there are animals out there that that you just have to be mindful of and you've got to be prepared because inevitably you will encounter some of these animals. Um, bears saw plenty of black bear on the trail, um, more than more than 10, I'd say, and, and some were very close. But, you know, I, I, I had the skills to um, scare them off, I guess you could say. It was just a little bit difficult sometimes when they were habituated and uh, weren't afraid of weren't afraid of humans. That's when it can get a little bit sticky. But Snakes, I uh, saw more than 10 snakes a day in certain sections, especially on sunny days. You know, the trail is 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 the sunniest spot typically in the woods, you know, because they have a little, a little clearing of trees. So the snakes, unfortunately, like to hang out right on the trail. Um, so I'd constantly be having to watch my step there. My, my friend almost stepped on a timber rattlesnake before I shoved him in the briars and he was pretty mad at the time, but, um, I think he was, he was thankful in the long run. I think, uh, a patch of briars is a, is a better option than, than a timber rattlesnake bite. Uh, so yeah, poisonous plants, as Monty was talking about, poison ivy never affected me until now. Um, ticks, black-legged ticks, um, definitely, you know, Lyme disease is a huge issue on the trail. It gets a lot of people off the trail. Um, mosquitoes, yeah, harbor things like West Nile virus. Um, there's really no way to fully fight back against all the mosquitoes that are going to be flying in and out of your face and, you know, you know, through your nose and stuff like that. You just got to wear bug spray when you can and, and um, try to try to mentally fight back against all these all these mosquitoes going around you. Um, and then mice, too. Those can be a pretty big issue on trail, uh, especially at the Appalachian Trail shelters. They like to hang out around the shelters. Um, and I've heard horror stories of mice crawling into people's mouths while those while they're sleeping. Um, it's I don't know if that was just a story or if it was just you know trying to motivate hikers to hang up their food properly, but but I did my due 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 due, due, due diligence there and um, stayed away from the mice. All right, so we're going to move on to challenges and mistakes. Not going to be able to cover all of these tonight, but I will cover a few. So um, in terms of biggest challenges, weather was obviously a a huge one. Um, I experienced about every every different type of weather you could imagine while I was while I was hiking. Um, that picture at the bottom left there, that's me on uh, the summit of Mount Washington. That's in New Hampshire, uh, one of the tallest peaks on the trail. And that's note that's in the middle of summer, I think late July, I believe. Um, and I had to take out all of the gear in my backpack and put it on my body just to try to stay warm while I was on top of the summit. And that wasn't the only time where I was doing that in the middle of in the middle of the summer. Um, the, yeah, the wind was crazy. And um, there's, there's just there's a lot of and you know, in Pennsylvania, too, it'd be 95 degrees hot and humid, you know, dying of thirst almost. But uh, you experience, yeah, essentially every every type of weather, and you've got to be prepared for it all. Um, so terrain, a lot of rocks, a lot of mud. That picture in the middle there is of Pennsylvania. They call it Rocksylvania for a reason. That's not just you know a, a rock cropping on the on the side of the trail. I actually had to go through that, and that was essentially the whole northern half of Pennsylvania, just crawling over these rocks. And uh, it didn't really help that there were timber rattlesnakes on there as well. But um, 
Yeah. And the, a lot of mud too. It didn't want to gross anybody out by extending that picture on the bottom right too big but that's my feet after a long day of hiking in vermont um some people really love vermont but for me i hiked it during a very during an especially rainy time of the year uh so my feet were just caked in in mud taking you know, almost like 15 minutes just to scrub them off in a stream and get somewhat clean uh, and then at the top right there that's uh massachusetts after a rainstorm um and again that's not a stream that's the trail and it is probably about two maybe not two feet of water but it's it was it was definitely over a foot of of water that i just had to i just had to trudge through um but you know you you try to have fun with it while you're out there. Um, and so biggest mistakes, I'd say I went a little bit too fast. Um, I, I say that just because at the time I still had that competitive runner mindset in me. And uh, I, I think I was was trying to do a little bit you know, too much. I didn't get injured, but I would just like to, if I were to do it again, maybe slow down and take a little bit more time. Um, take a little bit more time at like the, you know, the, the mountain views and maybe a little bit more time in town and, and kind of take a step back and appreciate where I am rather than just putting my head down and hiking so fast. Um, I did this thing called the four state challenge, which is 45 miles in less than 24 hours. Um, and that's in doing so you, you touch four states in less than 24 hours. I think it's, um, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and then Pennsylvania. And that wrecked me. <laughs> I would not recommend anybody to do that. It was, I learned a lot while doing it, but it, it, I don't know if I would call it fun, maybe type two fun when looking back on it. Um, I realized that maybe, maybe I learned something in the process. Um, so most difficult sections, the White Mountains are notorious for being a very difficult section, um, just because there's, you know, the mountains are, are just so tall there and there's no switchbacks. So you really just go straight up the mountain and then straight down the mountain. Uh, Northern Pennsylvania, again, with the rocks, really difficult. Southern Maine, you have something called Mahusik Notch, which is the hardest mile on the Appalachian Trail. Um, I definitely agree with that. Um, it's, it's, um, it took me three hours to walk one mile simply because there's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a ton of boulders, rocks. You're kind of like crawling in and out these crevices and definitely didn't fit my, my tall frame. And I also had a full resupply on my back. Um, so really tested me mentally. There's no doubt about that. New York, lots of ups and downs. And again, Vermont, just with the mud. And, um, when I was going through, just probably not the, not the best time to be, to be hiking, but Vermont was, yeah, Vermont was definitely difficult for me. Okay, so favorite sections and towns. Uh, again, just gonna cover a couple of these. So Grayson Highlands, uh, kind of your stereotypical number one section on the Appalachian Trail. I really loved it. Um, it's hard to beat, you know, it's hard to beat ponies. Uh, so I was, you know, on this high, high elevation mountain range just with wild ponies walking all around me. And um, that was really special. I did a lot of backpacking there when I was in college too. So it was familiar. I had all those, you know, memories coming back to me. Um, the 100 mile wilderness that's in Maine. Um, again, one of my favorite sections, just because it really was it lived up to the name it was wilderness. And I think that's such a unique and rare experience nowadays. And I felt very fortunate to be immersed in in that wilderness and, and see all that beautiful scenery. And uh, also the Rhone Highlands was was another one of my favorite sections simply because it was familiar and also, you know, the wide open grassy balds in the North Carolina mountains are really, really special to see. So favorite towns, we got Damascus uh, as number one, that's kind of, that's in Virginia. That's essentially, that's the trail town for, for the Appalachian Trail. Um, they do a lot of festivals there and they really treat the hikers well in Damascus. And uh, the second one is Millinocket in Maine. I like that one. That was the the last town I visited. That was after I completed the trail. I went to Millinocket, so I had, I guess, this this fresh feeling of of accomplishment. And um, I spent, uh, you know, I, I spent the the whole day there, like just eating pizza and I guess getting getting back into the real world. Um, and then Hanover in New Hampshire. That was another one of my favorite sections, um, or another one of my favorite towns, simply because I um, my my family sent me a a care package, I guess you could say. They sent it to the to the post office and uh, Hanover is Dartmouth's campus. Um, so I picked up the I picked up the care package and and I opened it and I guess my family knows me really well because it was filled with pumpkin bread. Uh, and so I um I spent the rest of the day just just sitting in a field, you know, as these you know nicely dressed students and professors were walking by me and I was this smelly hiker sitting in a grassy field eating or shoving my face with with pumpkin bread and uh, I couldn't have been happier. <laughs> 
All right, so that brings us to the northern terminus, Mount Katahdin. Uh, definitely an epic end to an epic journey. Um, you know, you really get above the clouds when 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 you're on on top of Mount Katahdin. Um, you know, I, I I thought I was at the summit two miles before I was really there. There's a lot of things on the trail. There's a lot of false summits, you would call them. I mean, you see something in the sky and you're like, that's got to be the summit. And then you get there and and you realize you still got two miles to go. So I already had my like, crying episode, just emotional excitement dump. And then I get to the top of what I thought was the summit. And then I realized that I still have two miles to go. Uh, so that that stunk. But, you know, at the same time, I was a little bit happy because, I, you know, the journey goes on. Right. But um and then when I did get to the summit, I, um, I, all my emotions had already been dumped out, I guess, and it was a little bit anticlimactic in that sense. But I did spend a long time sitting on top of, of the summit, enjoying the view. Uh, I think I was eating eating peanut butter or something while I was up there. But um, definitely, definitely a, an overwhelming sense of accomplishment and and a lot to reflect on there. All right, so seven months later. All right, so I knew I wanted to do this again. Um, I, for those seven months, I, I was saving money, um, and I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do at first. But you know, uh, the mountains of Sea Trail definitely stuck out to me. Um, and it, it's a journey, a true journey across North Carolina. Um, as you all know, I'm sure that North Carolina is split up into three distinct regions, so it's a really unique trail in that sense. You go through the coast, the Piedmont, and then you have the mountains as well. So uh, North Carolina has a lot to offer, and you know, being from North Carolina, it definitely and um, living in in all three regions of North Carolina, it was definitely a um, a great way to um, to appreciate and to get to know the state a little bit more. It stretches 1,200 miles, uh, nearly 1,200 miles, um, and like the Appalachian Trail, the Mountains of Sea Trail is um, maintained and managed by a nonprofit organization known as the Friends of the Mountains of Sea Trail, but they can't do it all by themselves. They partner with um, local, state, and uh, federal land management agencies in order to maintain and manage the entire Mountains to Sea Trail. It's really a group effort, and it definitely works, and it's an effective model to um to maintain to maintain the trail and the Mountains of Sea Trail. They mobilize, you know hundreds of volunteers every year to get out and work on the trail it's um it's really exceptional to see and also uh you know the, the trail is not necessarily completed yet it involves 700 miles of trail and about 475 miles of connecting roads um so a lot of the times I, I was road walking but i think it was a unique experience because i was able to see the trail in its infancy stage right and there's a lot of momentum right now with the mountains to sea trail so it was cool to kind of be on that on that leading edge while i was hiking all right so why i decided to hike the mountains to sea trail well i i grew up in in north carolina and um you know the the appalachian trail it felt like it felt like a, a personal journey it felt like a personal accomplishment i didn't really share that experience with many people. I didn't take many pictures. And I knew if I were to do this again, if I were to do another long distance hike, I wanted to make sure um, to do it a little bit differently. I wanted to to give back. I wanted to loop in other people. I wanted to um, to, I guess, forge a deeper connection with North Carolina people, habitat and wildlife. I mean, this was, you know, this is my home. And I think, you know, what what better way to, to see my home than to walk straight through it. So um, and I, I I knew I couldn't do this by myself. Um, my idea was, you know, to fundraise to raise money for for a mission for an organization that 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 I believed in. And um, so I did some research while I was living in New Hampshire, and uh, the Wildlife Federation popped up, and you know, I, I dug into it a little bit, and then I, I called um, Kate Griner, who is the uh, vice president of philanthropy at the Wildlife Federation, and you know, we had a nice long discussion. Um, and she told me all about the Wildlife Federation, and uh, I told her about what I was trying to do. And, you know, I was really excited at the time, and, and she matched my enthusiasm and then, you know, added 20 notches to it. So I was pumped up after that, and I, I knew that they were the right people to to be involved in. This was an active organization, and, you know, money, money raised for NCWF, I knew would go to 
would go to wildlife and habitat and protecting, conserving, and restoring wildlife and habitat. So Kate got me in touch with Christine, who's the communications director at NCWF and real professional, really great at what she does. And we work to promote this hike. I got in touch with news outlets and um, I wrote, you know, short, uh, short articles, um, you know, did interviews, did all sorts of stuff to try to get the message, to get the message around. And um so it, it was it was a cool it was a cool way to collaborate with a nonprofit organization. All right, so food jumping around a little bit, but got to touch on food again, right? So I experienced a lot of home cooked meals while I was on the Mountains of Sea Trail. I definitely wasn't wasn't deprived by by any means of the word. So. Um, Fortunately, like I had a lot of I had a lot of help and support. Um, the Friends of the Mountains of Sea Trail, they have a network called Trail Angels. And these are folks that uh, will have, have volunteered their time to to help out hikers as they go. And they uh, a lot of times, you know, would stop and give me water or sometimes they would even pick me up and take me to their home and, um, you know, feed me like a nice home cooked meal and then send me on my way. Um, you know, same thing with the Wildlife Federation, stayed with a lot of Wildlife Federation folks, met a lot of folks along the way, too. Um, and my family lives at the beach, so I got to stay with them a couple nights, eat some good food. Um, Durham still had family and friends. Um, that was a lot of fun. I got to spend time with my with my old neighbors, and um, they they baked me a cake on my birthday with mountains on it. So that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. Can't beat that. Um, so yeah, it was just a, it was a, a cool way to to reconnect with with some folks that I haven't that I hadn't seen in a while. And yeah, also a lot of restaurants too, a lot of great local North Carolina restaurants, especially on the coast, which is really, really tasty. Um, yep. Had the gas station diet going for a while, general stores for sure, grocery stores. And then once I got towards the mountains, I ate a lot of backpacking food again, like I did on the Appalachian Trail. So I kind of went back to my, my GORP diet, I guess you could say. All right, so a question I get quite a bit is where did I sleep while I was hiking on the mountains, the sea trail? And the answer is I slept in some pretty weird places. Um, again, most of the time, probably about half of the nights I spent on the trail, I did have either a family member or, you know, like I stayed with um, John Robbins, who was a NCWF board member. I have to give him a shout out. I think he's on the call, but um, he he lives in Asheville and he let me um, you know stay in his home for a night and, you know, great hospitality there. Um, again, the family would take me in, um, in Boone. I saw Ellie and she took me in for a couple of days. So, uh, I, I did, I was treated very well to guest bedrooms quite a bit, but when I wasn't staying in a guest bedroom, I had to get a little bit creative with where I slept at night. Um, when I was in the mountains, that was really easy because I could just, you know, sleep in the back country or sleep in a campground or a state park or something. But, you know, towards the coast and the Piedmont, a lot of those options didn't exist. So I kind of had to rely on the generosity of of people around me. So I did sleep in sheds. I did sleep in barns. Um, I, I always asked people first. I didn't want to wake up with a shotgun in my face. Um, so yeah, that picture on the far right is that's all my camping stuff in a shed. Uh, that was actually pretty comfy. I had a heater in there too. So not bad. Um, yeah, barns, old plantations, slept behind churches a lot. Um, uh, fire stations, fire stations were a big one for me. They really helped me out along the trail. Uh, Beaver Dam Fire Department and Van Crossroads are two that definitely stick out in my mind. Uh, the Van Crossroads Fire Department, the chief didn't even know me. I mean, he heard about what I was doing, but he just gave me the code to the to the to the fire station and, and let me, you know, just let me have the whole fire station for myself to myself for an entire afternoon and through the night. And then I left in the morning. So I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty cool that people trusted me without even without even knowing me like that. So um, yeah, again, just a lot of weird places, but um, and then general stores as well, were, were very receptive to me camping out behind the store so long as I bought a hamburger or something. All right, so people along the way. Um, this is this was a big one for me. I mean, I I, I went out. I set the intention um, of speaking to people while I was hiking. I, I wanted to, I guess, be a sponge, if 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 you will. I, I wanted to, I guess, hear what other people had to say and and kind of soak that in while I was while I was walking. Um, and again, you know, I let, I met a lot of NCWS staff and um, a lot of you know chapter leaders like Monty and Nadi and all you know all sorts of great people. The Mountains of Sea Trail Angels, you know, had some really great conversations with them. And you know, and then there's a lot of people that weren't even plugged into the trail that I met along the way. People that had no idea the Mountains of Sea Trail existed. People that were just sitting on their rocking chair on the front porch, and I'm this guy walking by with this big backpack on, and I've got these trekking poles and 
people think that's a little bit strange. So they want to know what's going on and they yell out to me um, what I'm doing. And um, that's a, that's a pretty good icebreaker, I'd say. So it, 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 it's, that's, that's where it started. And it was cool to hear, again, hear people's stories, hear why they love North Carolina, you know, what, what gets them excited about the habitat and the wildlife and, and just, yeah, just hear their story and, and just, just listen, listen to people. It was really a, a great experience and, and definitely restored my faith in humanity. There's no doubt about that. Okay. So, so plants on the mountains, the sea trail, we're all really lucky to live in North Carolina. There's, you know, great biodiversity in terms of plant life in North Carolina, um, home to more than 3,900 native plants across North Carolina. It's a really diverse state. Uh, I did, I started hiking in late March and I finished in May. So, I mean, I really hit it right in spring and um, I, I was, you know, tearing up the entire time and I had a clogged nose and I was, you know, yakking the entire time, but it was, I think worth it. It was definitely worth it to see, you know, this, this wonderland of, of wildflowers and, and native plants all around me. All right. So wildlife on the mountains, the sea trail, again, three distinct biomes um, in North Carolina, uh, which, which really created some, some opportunities for just in, really creates an opportunity for incredible biodiversity in terms of wildlife. I don't really know if you can consider cows and horses wildlife, but I, in terms of animals, that's definitely what I saw the most of is a lot of cows, a lot of horses. Some of them were on the trail and I had to, you know, I had to go around them or stand my ground, I guess. But um, yeah, Salamander capital of the world and the Great Smoky Mountains. I don't know who coined that phrase, but uh, definitely, definitely is true. I saw a lot of salamanders, spring bird migration, um, thinking of Pea Island Not, um, National Wildlife Refuge, which is down towards the coast, one of the biggest hotspots, big, uh, biggest hotspots for birds in the state of North Carolina, really cool to see in the middle of spring. And um, yeah, lots of bears, I think I only saw one bear, just the, the butt of a bear, which is um, probably, probably how you want it to be, right. Um, but they're out there for sure in the mountains and, and uh, they're in the coast as well. And uh, bugling elk, so the Great Smoky Mountains, um, introduced elk into the region, or reintroduced, I should say, I believe in the early 2000s. So when I was in the smoky section, I heard bugling elk every morning, you know, which is really cool to, to experience as I'm, you know, waking up and, you know, the mist is coming off the mountain and this, 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 this elk is bugling off in the distance. Um, insects. Yeah, definitely. Lots of, lots of pollinators, lots of stinging insects, all sorts of stuff, fish, reptiles, amphibians. I mean, it, you name it. And I probably saw it while I was on the trail. So challenges and mistakes, again, just going to cover a few of these. So road walking was a big challenge. Again, the Mountains of Sea Trail still has about 475 miles of connecting roads. Um, and that that was a little bit tricky at times. Uh, you know, it's, some of them are, some of these roads are just sleepy country back roads, but others are, you know, really busy highways that I had to walk on. Um, and that didn't involve any passive hiking. I, I really had to hone in and make sure that everyone was paying attention when they were driving by me and um, I had to be ready to dive off into the ditch if I needed to. Um, fortunately, nothing bad happened, but I, you, I really had to be on top of my game when I was walking on the roads. And also, you know, the terrain of roads, I mean, that's, that's really hard on your feet and it's also asphalt and the sun's gonna be shining on you through the entire day. So I got pretty sunburned. Um, and off-leash dogs, uh, I, I'd say that's number one for me in terms of challenges. I mean, I kind of left the trail with this, with this fear of dogs that I've never really had before, simply because there's a lot of off-leash dogs in North Carolina, especially in the coastal region. And, um, and you know, I had uh, pit bulls and also German shepherds that would run at me pretty fast. Um, and fortunately, they were friendly, but I, I had to, I had to be ready, I guess, with my, with my trekking poles to fight back if I needed to. Fortunately, it never came down to that, but there were some pretty mean dogs on the trail. That being said, you know, the MST is really doing everything they can to make sure that hikers are safe and they're trying to do what they can to, um, you know, get the trail off the roads when they can. So it's, it's, they're, they're definitely thinking about the hikers and trying to keep the hikers safe. Um, so weather was tough. Uh, yeah, again, lots of weather with the three regions of North Carolina, I'd say in, um, at the beach, it was really difficult with the wind. I'm thinking about Ocracoke Island probably, you know, 40 mile per hour wind, bringing up all these sand crystals that are hitting me in the face and, you know, dumping out my shoes at the end of every mile and, and, you know, trying to blow all this stuff out of my nose was, was, was difficult at times for sure. 
All right, favorite sections and towns on the Mountains of Sea Trail. So number one, definitely the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, always has a, you know, a, a place in my heart just because I was able to, you know, backpack there. It was, I think the first place I ever backpacked was in the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, and I try to go back there as much as I can. It really, really, really is uh, is is a great spot that I that I love to be where whenever I can be. Um, also, Pea Island Wildlife Refuge, again, with just the bird diversity. Um, Eno River State Park. Another great section, simply because that's my hometown. Also, just a beautiful section on the river. Um, it was really great to, I get, yeah, again, just be filled with that that nostalgia and and those memories as I was walking. Stone Mountain State Park. Um, that's a place I hadn't hiked before the Mountains of Sea Trail. Really cool area. Um, I don't really know why exactly, like geologically speaking, Stone Mountain looks like that, but it's, you know, this big granite dome and it kind of looks like just a wave of rock that's coming at you. But I, I thought that was really cool. I spent a long time just kind of gaping up there with my mouth hanging open. But um, and then Limbo Gorge Wilderness, uh, another one of my favorite sections. It's it's a favorite section, but. I never have an easy time going through the Limville Gorge Wilderness. I, when I was in college, I backpacked there quite a bit, and it seems like every time I go there, something something goes wrong. Um, it, you know, I've I've fallen into the gorge. Uh, I've you know broken things in my backpack. Uh, this time, when I was on the Mountains of Sea Trail, this um, when I was in the Limville Gorge, I had heat stroke, and I also got caught in a lightning storm when I was finally got out of the gorge. So it's, it's again, type two fun. We're looking back. I feel like I learned a lot in the process and it's still a beautiful section of trail, but there's a lot of hardship that comes with, with that beauty, I guess. Um, so favorite towns and cities, Durham, again, um, definitely one of my favorites, just, just being the hometown Boone NC. Uh, I got off trail and, um, got to go to a wedding for a couple of days and that was a lot of fun. I got to see Ellie and Boone, uh, Elkin, North Carolina, um, that's kind of what Damascus is to the Appalachian Trail, just kind of the, the main trail town for the mountains to see. Uh, so they really treat hikers well. And I had some great trail angels that took care of me while I was in Elkin. Uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah, the trail goes right through Asheville. Really cool. Um, and, you know, John Robbins took care of me for that night. And uh, I also spent a couple of days off just uh, tour, like touring the city. Um, and, you know, me and Ellie like walked around. We had a lot of good food. We drank a lot of good beer and you know, free bluegrass concert in the evening. And the you know, next day I went to the Arboretum. So really just a great time to to take a little bit of time off and um, and enjoy not not hiking for an entire day. Uh, and also Ocracoke, again, one of my favorite sections just because I'd never been there before and really cool section on the coast that's um, that's pretty wild. And um, the the city itself, or at least the town itself, when I was there was pretty sleepy. So it was cool to be able to see that before all the summer tourists came in. Okay, so that brings us to the Western Terminus, Klingman's Dome. Um, and yeah, it's it was a different feeling than, than when I finished the Appalachian Trail. I, I didn't feel so so deprived from from comforts, I guess you could say, you know, I, I, I had a lot of people feeding me really good food, I had the social connections, I was staying indoors quite a bit. So I felt refreshed, you know, I, I felt, you know, even ready to to keep going. But at the same time, I was, I was content too. I mean, you know, it was it was a success. in in terms of, you know, the, the project with the Wildlife Federation, we raised over $8,000 for North Carolina wildlife and habitat. And I believe that number has reached over $10,000 at this point. So, you know, really just it was I was definitely proud to have been a part of a part of that whole project and to have met so many people with the Wildlife Federation. And how the hike inspired a career in conservation. Um, yeah, so that, that it's I guess before I hiked the Mountains of Sea Trail, I really wasn't certain about what I wanted to do. I had some ideas, um, but I definitely wasn't certain. I was still, I, I think a lot of people my age, at least nowadays, you know, really just kind of wandering around wondering, you know, what's what's going to fill them up? What's going to be rewarding? What's going to be meaningful? And I didn't know that, but then I hiked the Mountains of Sea Trail and I finished and you know, there really wasn't a doubt in my mind that that this is, I wanted to step into the field of conservation. I wanted to to enter this to enter this career and and um, because I knew it would be rewarding, I knew it would be personal, and um, I had already you know collaborated with the Wildlife Federation, and um, you know they were they they treated me like family, and I considered them them family along the way too. So it was just a great way to to be exposed to a, a nonprofit organization, and it was a it was a unique introduction too. I mean, I I never. I never felt like I was interviewing, you know, I never set out on this, on this trail thinking that it was going to end up 
with a, with a job. It just, it just happened to work out that way. I got off the trail and a position opened up at the wildlife federation and everyone already knew me. So I had a, someone, um, you know, Christine put in a good word and sent me the information and I interviewed. And, um, when I sat down for the interview, it was, it was, it was easy because I, I knew everybody and, and they knew me and I, I met them without trying to, without trying to prove myself. I met them just as, just as a hiker, you know, um, and, and yeah, it's just really just a, a special, a special experience. And, um, and then it was a, it was an easy transition too. you know, I, I got off the trail and um, I, I got the job with the wildlife federation. And one of my first events was to, you know, go on a hike with the Noose river Hawks, which is a local chapter of the wildlife federation. And, um, you know, I was hiking and it was essentially that, that was a part of my job was to go on this nature walk. So, uh, pretty cool opportunity there. I consider myself very lucky. I definitely, definitely don't take it for, for granted. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it was a good opportunity for, for me to, um, to give back and also be able to like, I guess, instill some of my own creativity and some of my own ideas and, um, be able to, to do so with the support of the wildlife federation. So it's, I've only been on the job for nine months, but it's really been a overwhelmingly positive experience. And I'm really excited about where the organization is heading and all the people that are going to be with me along the way. All right. So we're going to roll into some favorite pictures here, had a lot of pictures on the trail, not so many on the Appalachian trail, but I do have a few of those to start. So top mountain view on the Appalachian Trail, I guess I have a few of these. This is the presidential range in New Hampshire, um, kind of like a Lord of the Rings feeling to it, but really um, beautiful section. Had McAfee Knob in Virginia. I, I found that after thunderstorms, you really get some great views if you find yourself on top of a mountain. Uh, this was close to when the sun was setting. Definitely, definitely cool to feel like you're on top of the world there. Max Patch, uh, I guess you can't see, but there are some red-tailed hawks swirling in the distance there. Mount Katahdin, Maine, again, had this, you know, sense of accomplishment coupled with, you know, a beautiful mountain view. All right, so moving on to some mountains and sea trail pictures. Got uh, lighthouses here, Ocracoke on the left and Cape Hatteras on the right. I also passed through um, Bodie Lighthouse, I believe it's called. So three lighthouses on the mountains and sea trail. Ferry rides, two ferry rides. Uh, and this was a unique experience simply because you know, normally people are getting on the ferry in a, in a, in a car and I was a pedestrian. So I kind of got some, some special treatment and got to, got to meet all the folks that were working on the ferry, which is really, which is really fun. Sunrise on the ferry. Um, I actually had to get off the ferry because someone crashed their sailboat in the middle of the route, but I did get back on five hours later. Uh, I just had to wander around Ocracoke for a while. Fishing. So yeah, you know, fishing is a huge industry in North Carolina. So I got a lot of pictures related to that. Yeah, I think crab traps here. All right, Ocracoke Island again, a you know beautiful coastal view overlooking the Pamlico Sound. Who doesn't love a sunset on the coast? Cedar Island. Uh, this is Surf City, another sunset on the coast. That was my camp spot for the night. Um, it was a really cold camp spot for sure, with the wind, cold wind coming off the coming off the water there, but um, worth it for that view. Another sunset on the coast, Ocracoke Island, uh, kind of looks like a thunderstorm is swirling off there in the distance. Another, I think this is the last one of Ocracoke, uh, another sunset. All right, bridges, the Noose River, um, a lot of cool bridges going over the Noose River. This one in particular is one of my favorites. And here's another one here over the Noose River. Surf City Bridge, this was built in 2018, very, uh, relevant, so a pretty new bridge and the Mountains of Sea Trail goes right over, goes right over the bridge. Uh, lots of churches on the mountains of Sea Trail, um, and you know this was pretty cool to to be able to walk past all these churches. I mean, the architecture was really interesting, and um, to you know hear the hear the church bells on Sunday morning, and also the stained glass was really cool to be able to to witness and and, and be a part of that. Another church here, and one more church. Um, yeah, this was a old abandoned church in White Oak. So no shortage of historic sites in North Carolina as well. And the Mountains of Sea Trail runs through quite a few of them. This is Bentonville Battlefield, um, one of the last and uh, largest battles fought in the Civil War. Another historic site, um, you know, the old textile mills in Hillsborough, North Carolina over the Eno River. 
Uh, this is Harmony Hall Plantation on the Cape Fear River, uh, one of the oldest residencies in North Carolina. I actually got to camp out on the, um, you know, in this in this site, and um, it was, you know, it was a little bit a little bit creepy because it was abandoned in this huge, you know, area of land. So I kind of just like hugged hugged the tree line and um, hoped that nothing bad happened. So I, I was fine though. Uh, another historic site, uh, Morse Creek National Battlefield. And then, yeah, lots of old general stores, uh, Rockford General Store on the left and Pretty's on the right. Um, both were, you know, founded over 100 years ago and both had people still working in the store. Um, I think third generation folks that were working in the store really, I mean, like teary eyed when they were just talking about the history of the place. All right. So some engines here got a classic El Camino. Uh, don't know if it would still run. I saw a lot of old cars out in the out in people's yards, but. Um, Cessna 172 kind of brought me back to my days when I thought I was going to be a pilot. Um, this is Lake Ridge Aero Park in Durham. So really cool to, you know, see these, these small planes kind of landing and taking off right where I was walking. Uh, Holly Shelter Game Land. All right, so a lot of pictures related to farming as well. It's a huge industry in North Carolina. And I had a lot of um, trucks filled with pigs or filled with chickens that would drive past me some days, like every 15 minutes, I'd have one of these things just, just, just rolling down the road right past me. So I really had to get used to that smell. Farming again, yeah, hay bales in a barn. Um, yeah, again, tons of cows and horses. Uh, this, these are some horses at Falls Lake. Pilot Mountain, um, some cows. I kind of like this one because it seems like they're, they're uh, posing for an album cover or something. <laughs> All right, so rivers, streams, and lakes. This is Falls Lake, sunrise. Uh, Falls Lake again. This was a cool spot because um, definitely a ton of carp, I believe, at the end of this bridge. Really cool to see. Eno River again. Harper Creek Falls, one of my favorite spots on the trail. I wasn't expecting this, and uh, I spent probably way longer than I should have spent there just kind of swimming around that little, that little oasis. Um, Deep Creek in the Great Smoky Mountains. Again, love the Smoky Mountains. Um, and this creek was, you know, low elevation creeks, so tons of wildlife there. Okanalufte River in Cherokee runs right through the town. Lake Townsend, Greensboro, early in the morning on a cold, on a cold day. So you can see the 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 fog coming off of, of the lake there. Pilot Mountain, um, definitely the weirdest mountain I think I've ever seen. Uh, I don't know exactly why it it looks like that, but I mean, I guess you can understand why it's called Pilot Mountain. Um, definitely a landmark. Moses Cone Memorial Park in Watauga County. Uh, again, I used to run here a lot when I was in school, so this is cool to um, get back to that area and and, and see it um, see it when the sun is rising. Water Rock Knob, one of my favorite views on the trail. Uh, right before you get into the Smokies, beautiful section. Uh, Mount Mitchell, this is the tallest point on the Mountains of Sea Trail, um, the tallest point east of the Mississippi, I believe. Uh, hard climb, lots of gradual switchbacks, but definitely worth it for that view at the end. Linville Gorge from Table Rock, um, yeah, the menacing Linville Gorge, uh, but definitely some, some wild places in there and uh, some really great views. Stone Mountain State Park, there's that granite dome again. All right, so to trees, so lots of Spanish moss draping over the trees, especially along the coast. Uh, and on the right is a bald cypress kind of on its own in the middle of the lake there creeping out. Lots of pine trees, loblolly pines, longleaf pines, um, especially at the coast. This is Holly Shelter game land. At right, the famous butt tree at Trout Lake. Um, I've been there quite a bit when um, that's, that's near Boone, so I used to run Trout Lake quite a bit. So it was cool to see that landmark again. Uh, Pisgah National Forest near Boone, um, you know, lots of lonely trees out in the middle of a mountain field. So to fungi, this is a uh, Dirad Saddle. Got a lot of cool pictures of plants and um, plants and fungi, just, you know, especially in the mountains where it was uh, typically pretty wet and, and warm as well. Puffballs, hemlock varnish shelf, straight stocked into Loma, really cool pictures here. And then turkey tail, of course, a lot of downed trees. Uh, so on to animals. This is a bumblebee and Canadian loosewort. This is in Grandfather Mountain State Park. I think this uh, bumblebee was really interested in what it was doing. It didn't really mind that I got so close. Snails, a very photogenic green and null. And uh, eastern racer, again, probably got a little too close here. If it was a copperhead, I don't think I would have, but um, this, this guy didn't seem to mind. Swallowtail butterfly, again, lots of pollinators out on the trail. Appalachian cottontail. Box turtles, ton of box turtles on the roads too. 
All right, so to blooms, I uh, got a lot of great pictures again hiking in um, in in uh, in spring. So this is a dwarf crested iris, painted buckeye, flame azaleas in all different colors, rain lilies and fern fiddleheads. Uh, one of my personal favorites, pink lady slipper, mountain laurels, rhododendrons, all ones that I'm sure we've seen before, but definitely cool to see in bloom. Painted trillium. Fire Pink, Philadelphia Fleabane, Jack in the Pulpit, another one of my personal favorites. Mountain Dog Hobble, this one was filled with pollinators. And uh, Showy Orchis, which is a native, uh, na uh, native orchid. And so I would, I would be remiss if I didn't you know, say how to get involved. I do wanna read this quote real quick. So acts of creation are ordinarily reserved for gods and poets, but humbler folk may circumvent this restriction if they know how. To plant a pine, for example, one need be neither God nor poet. One need only own a shovel. By virtue of this curious loophole in the rules, any clodhopper may say, let there be a tree and there will be one. And um, that was written by Aldo Leopold in the San County Almanac, legendary conservationist. And what I, what I extract from that is, you know, it doesn't, you don't need to have, um, you don't need to have, I guess, a, a special skill in order to to get involved in conservation. You don't need to have a certain background. You know, all you really need is, you know, are your two hands and, and a willingness to to kind of dive in and, and be a part of it. So I really have seen firsthand in the nine months I've I've worked at the Wildlife Federation just how important volunteers are and 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 just how much fun it is to work with volunteers. I mean, they're there, they're giving they're giving an organization their time. There's not much. There's not much more you can ask for in it. Um, I, I feel very fortunate to be able to work with with volunteers on a daily basis. It's, it's, it's really just it really just a pleasure. And um, I, I would say that's probably the best way to get involved in organizations is to volunteer and kind of see that that portal into you know how how the organization runs and what they do and what they care about. And that doesn't have to be with NCWF. Of course, I'm um, I'm biased towards NCWF. I think we offer some great programs with our chapters um, and 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 really, you know, have a lot of opportunities for folks, no matter what your wildlife interests are. But there's also, you know, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, the Friends of the Mountains and Sea Trail. Fortunately, NCWF has started up a, a, um, a partnership with the Mountains and Sea Trail. So you can kind of, you know, volunteer for two organizations for the price of one. Um, and, you know, there's the, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Audubon Society. I mean, there's really just a lot of options out there to, to get involved and, and, and um, to do what you can as 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 one person and so i'm going to end on the year of the trail really some some great news here so uh the nc general assembly designated 2023 as nc year of the trail this is an effort led by the great trail state coalition which is a broad-based group of more than 50 uh, diverse organizations and agencies including the friends of the mountains of sea trail and actively supported by organizations such as the Noose River Hawks, which is a um, local wildlife chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation in Wake Forest. Had to give them a shout out. They're doing a lot of great work with the Year of the Trail. Uh, and so what this essentially is, it's the largest celebration of trails and outdoor recreation in North Carolina history. There's, like I said earlier, there's a lot of momentum for the Mountains to Sea Trail, for trails in general in North Carolina. And um, I do want to just close out real quick by reading off the House Bill, House Bill 554, which um, officially designates uh, 2023 as Year of the Trail. So the many miles of trails that exist throughout North Carolina have allowed countless individuals to reflect on the splendor of the state's natural world. Without a doubt, these pathways are not only a source of pride for the communities they serve, providing significant economic and environmental benefits, but are also an important feature in helping to improve the quality of life in our society by promoting healthy lifestyles via recreation, active transportation, and community building for all people, regardless of age, background, or ability. To celebrate the Year of the Trail, organizations and jurisdictions will offer special programming, festivals, and events highlighting and promoting all types of trails all across the state. The state of North Carolina designates the year 2023 as North Carolina Year of the Trail and encourages all North Carolinians to take advantage of their local and regional trail networks, do their part to further enhance North Carolina's trail networks, and pay tribute to everyone who has labored to maintain, um, that has labored to maintain and enlarge these public amenities. So really, again, a lot of momentum for trails, and there's some great work being done, and um, thank you guys for, for listening to me. Yeah.
And again, I will say there's a lot of things that I could have gone on a tangent for for about an hour. So if anybody has any specific questions about maybe how to through hike or, you know, how to poop in the woods or something like that, just feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to chat with you about it. Yep. Thank you. All right, thank you to Luke for that great presentation. So now we will move on to the question segment. So. Do we start? <clears throat> that uh, that year of the trail designation, uh, did the General Assembly, uh, you know, do anything else like, you know, come up with some funding? Yeah, that is part of the initiative is funding as well, but a lot of it is, um, you know, promotion uh, and celebrating of the trails through through events and uh, public outreach. Uh, but there is an, an effort in particular to build and maintain trails, which involves funding. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the things I definitely want to do is to paddle the Noose River. That's kind of an alternative way to uh, to experience the Mountains of Sea Trail. Um, if I can get the map up, I, I would, but it's uh, it does cut off a little bit of the road walking too. Um, and again, I would if I was going um, if I was going west to east, I think I would have would have paddled the Noose River section. I mean, that's a really cool way, and you do cut out some road walking too. But um, yeah, that's a cool section. Yes, yeah, so we asked about stop dates and um, if I, if I, um, you know, why I, why I decided to, to um, like when I decided to hike the Appalachian Trail. So uh, I chose to hike the Appalachian Trail. I mean, so I graduated, uh, I graduated from App State in uh, May of 2021. And I was on the trail the next day uh, and I actually had a job lined up for me in, um, when was that? In September. So I had a little bit of a deadline to get to. So that's kind of why I went on the quicker side. Uh, but I did, I did just squeeze it in. And also, yeah, you do see on the Appalachian Trail, you see a lot of folks that are, you know, have either just retired or are between jobs or people like myself who just graduated college. So a lot of people in the, in a transition period in their life. Yep. What was that? So I started the Mountains of Sea Trail on March 21st, and I finished um, in, I believe, May 13th, I want to say. Yep, in the middle of May. 52 days. When you were doing the MST, I mean, I could see some areas like you know, it might have been like the Appalachian Trail where you had markings on the trees. But when you're going through like more urban or more town type areas, how did you know, you know, which way to go? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. There are a lot of sections that that aren't um, blazed, I guess you could say. Um, there's there's a big effort right now with the Mountains of Sea Trail to mark some of these sections. I, I uh, with in terms of navigation. The Friends of the Mountains of Sea Trail, they offer uh, like, you know, really like step by step directions in terms of where to go. So if there is a road walk, I, I could, you know, pull up the, the Mountains of Sea Trail guide and it would it would tell me like, you know, turn left at this road, turn right at this road. Um, I also had an app on my phone where, you know, I had my location and I had uh, like, you know, over top of 
uh, the mountains to see trail so I could, you know, point my phone and, and real and figure out if I was on the right track or not, but it did get a little bit tricky at times. Um, but it, it was, it was blazed on the trail sections, but not so much in the road sections. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I had to rely on those guides. Mm -hmm. When you were hiking the AT, did you have a trail name? That's a good question. Um, so it started out as it started out as Granddaddy Longlegs. Um, I, I I couldn't. It was it was tough because I couldn't escape a name that that didn't involve my height, um, and it eventually shortened into Legs. So very fitting, right? <laughs> There's some weird trail names out there. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. <laughs> We have some questions from the chat online. Um, this one has a couple different ones. Um, the first one is how long did it take you to walk each trail? Yes, yeah, so the Appalachian Trail, it took me 97 days, which is uh, too fast. <laughs> and the Mountains of Sea Trail, it, it took me 52 days, um, definitely a little bit more reasonable. Yeah. Um, they then asked, did you ever have trouble finding water? Um, yeah, so there were some spots on the Appalachian Trail, especially in, in Pennsylvania, when, you know, like I said, it would be 95 degrees and, um, and humid and hot, and there'd be some, some streams that were dried out. I got really in a tight situation a couple times, got bailed out by, by some folks along the way. Um, and on the Mountains of Sea Trail, you know, not really. I, I could always stop and load up on water because there's typically like a, a general store or something, but, um, and when I was in the mountains, you, I, again, this could be a whole other presentation, but I would have to like filter my water. So I'd be stopping at streams and rivers and uh, preferably, you know, a river or stream where there's not a you know farmland nearby. And um, I would fill up my water and um, filter it and then drink that. But yeah. Yeah. So they asked, is there any special tools that you use for your water purification? Uh, Sawyer squeeze is what I used. Um, so I would have two, they call them like water bladders. Uh, and one I would mark as dirty water and one I would mark as clean water. And with the dirty water bottle, I would fill it up and I would put this Sawyer squeeze thing, screw that on. And that supposedly gets rid of 99.999% of the bugs that might get you sick. Um, and then I would, you know, filter that out. It's really easy. You just, you just squeeze it through and, and the water comes out clean and you just backwash it every now and then. Um, and it works out just fine. I, I never got sick. People did, but I was fine. Yep. Awesome. We have another question that asks if there's any porta potties on the trail. <laughs> yeah. So um, on the Appalachian Trail, they have these things called privies. There's quite a few of those. I mean, obviously these don't use water. It's it's just it's just a hole. I mean, it's a toilet seat, and then it's you know a big pit in the ground essentially. Um, but and aside from that, you know, it's really just you know backcountry going going to the bathroom in the woods just just knowing your stuff there but on the MSD it was a little bit easier there was a lot of you know public facilities and also gas station grocery stores where I could go to the bathroom yep and I would say just make sure you research ahead of time before you go into the backcountry because that's definitely an issue in terms of leave no trace it's it's important to know um to know like you know where you're going to be going to the bathroom and um how best it is to to go to the bathroom outdoors without leaving a trace so definitely do your research um no matter where you're no matter where you're backpacking yeah awesome so we have one last question in the chat from donna who asked how many pair of shoes did you go through on each trail so i went through um I was really stubborn about shoes. I, I don't know why I, I felt like I didn't need to change them out. I definitely did. Uh, I went through with three pairs on the Appalachian Trail, which is definitely low. Most people go up to like five or six pairs of shoes. On the Mountains of Sea Trail, it's, I feel like people won't believe me, but I, I, I had one pair of shoes the entire time. And at the end, I mean, they were essentially just threads on my feet. They were really close to essentially disintegrating. I don't know why I felt like I couldn't spend another 60 bucks on shoes, but uh, so one pair of shoes on the MST and three on the Appalachian Trail. Yep.
I just wanted to ask, what was your most unique wildlife encounter? That's a great question too. Um, the porcupines were, were, were pretty weird to see sometimes, uh, just with how slow they move. Oh man. Um, I, I had a, I had a couple bears that got really close to my tent, um, and got, that was, you know, to the point where I could, like, there was one that this is the one that, that sticks out in my memory, but it got so close to the point where, you know, I could, I could see the bear's breath and like the silhouette through my tent, you know, really spooky stuff. And, um, I had to think about that a little bit more because there was definitely some other some other animal encounters as well that <laughs> I, I made it out alive, but um, there were definitely some other animal encounters. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do most of the Appalachian by yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I started by myself um, and I, I met up with Ellie quite a bit because she was hiking as well. At the time we were at, kind of on different paces and she started before me, but I did catch up with her and we hiked for a little bit of the way together. Uh, but I met people along the way too. Um, it was probably about half and half, but a lot of times I was hiking by myself. Yes. But for the other half, I'd say I was with a small group of, of two or three people. There's a common thing called a trail family. When you're on the Appalachian Trail, it's kind of folks that you meet along the way and you just stick with for the duration of the trip. Yeah. Yeah, I've talked to people who did, you know, the part in Maine, and I know you made reference to that, but the people told me that maybe that last hundred miles or whatever they, they say is like really confusing and it's very easy to get lost. Did you find that? Relatively speaking, yes, it is easy to get lost compared to the entire Appalachian Trail. And I think most of that's just simply because they wanted to keep that section wild and, you know, putting a blaze on a tree. I think there was a lot of folks that were complaining that this is like taking away from the experience. Um, that being said, I didn't have any trouble finding my way. Uh, but again, in terms of like the entire AT, that was one of the more difficult sections in terms of navigation. Absolutely. With service as well. Yep. All right, thank you guys. Well, I hope that that was uh, a source of inspiration for you and I hope you're all gonna buy, a, uh, buy Luke a pair of shoes. Um, Luke, thank you very much. I, I certainly enjoyed this tremendously. I know you put a lot of work into assembling this. Um, what a wonderful story you had to share and a message too. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. It was fascinating. I also want to thank the webinar audience uh, tonight for, for joining us. Uh, this is the end of the webinar. Those that are in the room, please do stay because we're going to uh, have the raffle winners. Uh, there are some nice refreshments in the back and a chance to uh, ask you know personal questions with, with Luke or just chat amongst ourselves. So please do stay a little bit. Thanks to everybody on the webinar. Sorry, I have more. Um, we do hold these quarterly, by the way. I do want to mention that. So uh, the next one will be on June first. the uh, The speaker that we have for that is uh, is still TBD, but keep an eye on our website, and we'll be letting you know. But uh, we're going to be doing these every quarter here in person, in addition to the webinars that we do uh, in between. So thank you. <laughs>